Something began. Colin, over to you. Thank you for that introduction, John. Um, let me start by saying that when Peter originally approached me to nominate someone to be on this panel, I deliberately didn't nominate myself because I thought it was better to get someone else involved. He got trapped in an aeroplane. I'm not sure whether it's either in Cape Town or in Dubai. And so at 7 o'clock this morning, I had an email asking me to stand in for my colleague, Vim. So I'm here today. The person whom I'd nominated, Vim Hugo, is a very different sort of person from myself. He's more a nuts and bolts data engineer, whereas my involvement is more on the governance and the strategy and the policy side. And so my thoughts this morning, this afternoon rather, will reflect my approach to the issues at hand. Just a few comments about South Africa, and I've been asked to speak from that particular perspective. South Africa is one of those countries which is both um, has pluses and minuses associated with it. And let me just sketch some of those to you. It is the 25th largest country in the world in terms of um, area. The population is the 24th largest. It has a long coastline, 2,500 kilometers. And it, it is surrounded by two different oceans, namely the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. It's a nation of diversity with nearly 52 million people, a wide variety of population groups, cultures, and in fact, 11 official languages, and also a large number of different religious beliefs. However, that's on the plus side. On the downside, the income gap discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots is very large indeed, with major implications for the development of the country and for many other things. There are some major challenges on the, on the cards. I don't know whether this, I have a mobile phone here, let me, I'll put it over there. Will that help? There we are. Major education challenges. Educational quality is not what it should be. Healthcare challenges, could I just ask someone else to look on? Maybe I'm part of the e-infrastructure. <laughs> Healthcare challenges. I told you about being 24th and 25th in terms of population and area. But in terms of health care, on the World Health Index, South Africa stands at 175. In terms of per capita income, it stands at 72. However, on the World Bank G, uh, Global Economic Forum Biodiversity Potential Index, on a range from 0 to 100, where Brazil stands at 100, and a large number of countries are down at close to 0, South Africa stands at 20.7. In fact, there are only 17 countries in the world whose potential index is 20 or higher. So it's a developing country with many problems facing it, but on the other hand, a large number of opportunities and advantages and potential awaiting those who, who can take advantage of the data that's there and available. Very many rich data sets. The South African prehistoric record is rich and diverse. The tongue child was discovered in 1924, which gives us a long history into the origins of humankind. Mrs. Pless is well known. In paleontology, we also have a rich and diverse record. In the humanities, rich sociology, health, migration, records, a great variety of people and languages. We have the Mandela Papers whom everybody can access over the internet, but yet much of our social history is only verbally recorded and is being captured right now. The Southern Oceans present a vast amount of information for climatologists and marine biologists and other people like that. The Southern Skies are an area of great interest to the astronomers. And in fact, South Africa, particularly the Karoo region, is an area of great interest in terms of astronomy. The very long baseline interferometry international experiment has got one, one site in South Africa and it will soon extend thanks to investment by the European Union into a large number of sites around the borders of the country. 
a large number of other telescopes, SALT and Meerkat, will grow into the South African side of the SKA. But it's not only the large data sets that are important, but also the long tail of small, but increasingly getting thicker, smaller data sets that are also important. South Africa has a vast amount of natural resources, mineral resources. It has the world's fifth largest mining sector. In terms of the population distribution, there are five or rather six metros in South Africa with populations of more than a million. In fact, the Johannesburg Pretoria region has got a population roughly the equivalent of that of Portugal. So there are many different data challenges and issues to be faced. In terms of data, some areas are well organized, particularly in the earth and observation science areas, people are very well organized, but in other areas, not that well organized. Issue of interoperability of data is something that people have not yet thought about. Data sets sit with Stat South Africa, with metros, with uh, the, the, the finance department, and, but they don't speak to each other. The Department of Science and Technology and the National Research Foundation are very proactive in terms of promoting research. However, besides Department of Science and Technology, which promotes research, we've got a Department of Agriculture and a Department of Health and a Department of Higher Education and Training. And at the research level, these departments do not talk to each other, particularly when it comes to exchanging data. One of the um, things that reports to me is the National Research and Education Network. I had a letter from the Minister of Science and Technology telling me that the South African NREN should handle the connectivity between Cape Town and the South African Antarctic Base Station. Problem is that that connectivity is owned by two different government departments. And the two departments don't talk to each other about that. And there's been enormous problem trying to reconcile their activities around that. So we have some data policies, but we don't have a national data policy. We have lots of data, but people don't talk to each other. In terms of e-infrastructure or cyber infrastructure, in 2003, the Department of Science and Technology, in a long, in a very uh, proactive manner, started investing in cyber or e-infrastructure, establishing a national center for high performance computing and investing a substantial amount of money in the national NREN. These, these investments are coming to fruition and these activities are starting to bear fruit. We now have world-class high-performance computing and also world-class NREN. In 2008, I put a proposal to the Department of Science and Technology to start a data initiative. When the Director General saw my proposal, his first comment was, data is not important. Why did you write this proposal? The situation has changed now. It's only five years later, but it's very different. The, the D, um, VLDB proposal, which is what I called it then, has morphed into DERISA, the Data Intensive Research Initiative of South Africa. As John has just mentioned to you, we have two reviews underway right now. One to review e-infrastructure and some members of the steering committee of the e-infrastructure um, e review panel are in fact present in the audience today. We also have the research infrastructure review of which John is a member looking at those two areas. And e-infrastructure, of course, is key to both of those. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, perhaps, towards the end of February, there was um, a stakeholders meeting of the people involved in the Data Intensive Research Initiative of South Africa. This, at this meeting, we brought together users, researchers, participants from many areas of science activity in the country. And being aware of the RDA coming and knowing about the output of the, the G8 plus meeting, as I was a member of that particular working group, I put the question to the people on the ground, is this an activity that we should get involved with? And I got unanimous support from the researchers that we should do it. In fact, to quite a phrase that's become synonymous with RDA, let's just do it, let's just get on with it. So we have the support of scientists on the ground to both participate and share globally. Perhaps at the level of bureaucrats, we need to do a bit more convincing. Why do we need to be involved in this? Reflecting on it, it, it's clear that by contributing and sharing, 
one gains much more than just sitting on the sidelines. We need to become fully participating members of a world in which open science and open data are the common speak. The interoperability of data across disciplines and geographies is of course important. We have domain specific practices but we need to cross disciplinary boundaries and cross geographic boundaries. In South Africa we've got plenty of data and in fact north of where I live the whole of Africa has got vast amounts of data but not much of it has been tapped. Africa and South Africa have data but you also have data. We need to share that data. In, Af in Southern Africa we have a principle which we call Ubuntu and that it means that it's better to share than to just keep things to yourself. You gain much more by participating in the community and that's what we need to do. National policies do exist, but the question is whether these are being put into practice. We need to develop an RDA can perhaps assist us in this, is to develop the ecosystem of people, data scientists, also data aware scientists, and I regard these as being different from data specialist scientists. Also to develop our E and cyber infrastructure to cope with a vast amount of data, particularly as SKA rolls out. And in fact, it's a two-way collaboration between the data I have and the data that you have. In fact, data will enable us to address the challenges of our day. I don't believe that we, in the country which I represent here today, can afford not to participate. So, I believe that we will do so. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Colin.